Christy Schreiber, and welcome to the How to Love Lit Podcast. And I'm Gary Schreiber. Christy is an advanced placement and international baccalaureate literature teacher and a nationally board certified English teacher. Gary is an AP, IB history and psychology teacher and my husband. The purpose of this podcast is to take us all back through some of the great classics of literature. Some you read years ago and loved, others you may have hated, and some you may be studying right now. Christy will break down the story and highlight what makes these works a part of the so-called canon. We hope you enjoy our discussions and will join us for future podcasts by clicking on the subscribe. In fact, do it now. And Gary, who's reading many of these books for the first time, will look at them through the lens of history as well as psychology. We're going to start with The Scarlet Letter by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Christy picked this one. Why are we starting here, Christy? This is a fantastic book that really deals with the heart of what it means to be human. Hawthorne creates a scenario where three people are faced with something that's embarrassing, a really bad sin. It's not a mistake, but a choice, and it brings consequences and even victims. All three of them deal with their shame, their guilt, and their anger very differently. One runs and hides, denying public responsibility and leading a life of hypocrisy. Another views himself as a victim and allows himself to be filled with resentment and blame and obsession. And the third, our heroine, Hester, chooses an unusual path. She embraces her frailty, owns her choices, and sets on a journey that brings her public isolation. Of the three, it is by far the hardest road. We follow these three characters for seven years and listen to Hawthorne preach at us, really, on the virtue of authenticity at all costs. This is a political book. It's a religious book, but mostly it's a personal book, and it cuts to the heart of being a person. There are many ways to go deep within a world of literary criticism and discuss books in terms of all of their isms, such as feminism or Marxism or formalism or structuralism, This podcast is not about that. This podcast is about loving literature and letting it challenge our minds and touch our hearts. It's about understanding what's thought-provoking and timeless and beautiful. All the things I believe you will find inside the Scarlet Letters. So let's get started. Christy and I are going to spend five episodes going through the book. The first episode is short, and we're going to find some historical and cultural context for reading the book and basically sort through chapter one. Then we're going to spend three episodes going through the book chapter by chapter, highlighting some of what we consider the best parts. On the last episode, we'll dissect the last scaffold scene and discuss some of the most interesting features of the book as they relate to the theme, give you some ideas for literary essays if you have to write one of those, and kind of look at expanding the themes into modern life. So, Christy, tell us a little bit about Nathaniel Hawthorne, the author of this great book. First of all, let me say there is a lot to learn about Hawthorne and how he fits into the timeline of American literature. If you're interested, let me direct you to hawthorneinsalem.org. It will tell you more than you ever will want to know about Hawthorne, and not just this book, but many of his others. Let me start by saying uh, that he was born in Salem in Massachusetts. Massachusetts, if you're not familiar with American geography, is in the northeast uh, of the United States. His father, who was a sea captain, dies when he's four years old, and he's basically raised by a single mom. Uh, To me, this is interesting, only in light of the fact that this book uh, really is a a feminist book, and he has a strong uh, female lead, which is unusual, and I don't know, I have no reason to know this, except I think maybe it has to do with mommy, but anyway... uh, (laughs) He uh, is not that impressive during his growing up years that that I know anything about. He's not even a really good student. Um, He gets engaged and marries this lady named Sophia, and they move and start their journey in a place called Concord, Massachusetts, which is very interesting for a lot of reasons we're going to talk about in a minute. Uh, But this really becomes uh, a very strong influence in what makes him the great writer that he is. Uh, In 1846, I do want to point out that he takes a job at a custom house. This is interesting only because this story has a frame story. Now, a frame story is when you have 
a story within a story. We're really not going to get into the custom house part of the book because I have to be honest with you, it's pretty dull and it doesn't really add anything to the story itself. He talks about finding the Scarlet Letter and he gives you some indication uh, for what the theme is going to be. But mostly it's kind of a history lesson about what custom houses are and it doesn't really add a lot. He made some extra money because he was paid by the word. So let me just so just let me just lay the framework that there is a frame story and if you want to read it it's there for you too but we're going to start with chapter one uh, of the scarlet letter which was published in 1850 the scarlet letter when it first came out was a big money maker he didn't think it was going to be and i've read a couple of sources and the numbers go from anywhere between 2,500 copies to 4,000 to 10,000 sold in the first 10 days. So I don't really know, but I really feel like he himself was shocked uh, at why this book was so well received. And it really launched uh, his career and he went on to publish several more other uh, books that were successful, but I don't think were near as famous as this one. So that's a little bit about our author. Tell us about the time period, Gary, that we're talking about here. Well, Hawthorne comes to write this in an incredible period of United States history. Uh, he's born in 1804, dies in 1864, and that time period encompasses some of the most radical changes in the history of the United States. He lives through the presidencies of Jefferson and Jackson and Abraham Lincoln, if that gives you the, an idea of the expansiveness of the time period. Uh, he is going to be writing at the tail end of the um, Enlightenment age. We are leaving the Enlightenment age where people were focused on reason and logic and cause and effect and the scientific method and we're starting to enter the Romantic period in American literature and American history. The Romantic period is going to focus on the uh, internal voice and intuition and following your heart and things of that nature. And he writes to that and he's also living in a very interesting time period it's a time period in the united states when we're being overrun with reform movements everything from uh utopian movements um from po political movements that are going on during a time period it's the age of manifest destiny where the people are moving west in large numbers during his lifetime the United States doubles in size, literally. We get the Louisiana Purchase, the Texas Annexation, the Oregon Territory, the Florida Session. So Hawthorne's experience would have been this endless parade of uh, people moving west out there. We get uh, the Second Great Awakening, of which people like Charles G. Finney, the Oneida community, the Mormons are a part of. There's an abolitionist movement that becomes extremely strong during... Hawthorne's lifetime, there's the women's suffrage movement, temperance movements, all types of reform issues are swirling in the United States during his time period. And as an author, I like to think that some of these authors are amateur psychologists. They're studying all the people around them and taking bits and pieces of these people and turning them into characters in their books. And he seems to be taking so many elements from the Romantic period at this time period and putting them into his work. Well, let me say that American Romanticism is a little different than British Romanticism, which is, you know, the mother load of the Romantic movement. And we always think of the British writers, and this may be controversial to say, but we see them as the heavy hitters. I know they saw themselves as such. Uh, uh, William Blake and, and some of those guys, Keats and Percy. But uh, the American Romantics really become the first people, I believe, in America to make a name uh, for ourselves in terms of our writers. We see some guys come out, Washington Irving and Edgar Allan Poe and Emerson, Thoreau, and uh, Walt Whitman, who, who decided, screw you, Europe. I'm not going to write anything that you like. I don't care about your iambic whatever. And he kind of goes on his own way. But... Um, the things that they do take from the Romantic movement, and I, the only reason, I know most people don't care about this stuff, but it really does inform our understanding of what he's trying to say in the story, is that we're going to see in the book uh, a lot of supernatural stuff. Like, it's not supposed to be realistic. Now, it's not like science fiction, but there's things in there that, what? 
it couldn't be true, but yes, it is. And maybe it's not literally true, but it's symbolically true. We're also going to see him talk about things that were important to the people at that time. And I feel like they're still important to us today. This idea that every person should have a free freedom to be their own individual and have their own thoughts. I don't have to believe what the group thinks. Uh, I have worth as an individual, and my worth is independent from anything else. Uh, and we're going to see her or Hester leave her group and what the group does. And, of course, the group today isn't puritanical, but we do have a lot of pressure to conform to the values of our culture, and he speaks to that. So a lot of these things come out of this American romantic movement, and I bring that up because it kind of gives us some direction of, of where he's living and what he's trying to do. But I want to change directions and talk about the setting of the story because although he lives in the 19th century with some of my favorite peeps like Susan B. Anthony with the alligator purse, he's not talking about those people. He's talking about the 17th century Puritans of New England. And so he sets this in the middle of the 1600s, and that is a completely different world. What can you tell us about it? Well, it's very interesting. First of all, he's writing a book on 1650 from the lens of 1850, and every author cannot escape what historically we call the arrogance of the present. You always have your current values and your current biases that you will impose on a historical period. And I feel like Hawthorne certainly does that. Take some of his 1850 sensitivities and places on the 1650 Puritans that he's going to talk about. And what I want to talk about about the Puritans, before I get into the fact that Hawthorne, I feel like gives them a beating that they may not deserve, which they totally don't deserve, but I'll discuss that in a moment. I do want to say what the Puritans were actually bringing during that time period the Puritans were responsible for the foundations of democracy in the colonial period that eventually will become the democracy we live in now. They're foundational in establishing capitalism. Uh, the Puritan work ethic is the whole idea about profiting. They're going to be the uh, first group in the United States to be very serious about establishing formal education and requiring people to be educated. So they really lay down a lot of important foundational things that go on during that time period. Do you think they have anything to do with this American egalitarianism attitude that we all have that you're no better than me? They are absolutely foundational to that. Uh, a couple of things bring that out. Number one of which is one of the main reasons why they left England and the Anglican Church. They to leave that hierarchy because their congregationalist faith really promoted this idea that, that everyone was equal. And then not only that, they come to the United States and they live in a frontier society. Excuse me, they're colonies at the time, not United States. And they live in a frontier society. Well, in a frontier society, you have to create everything. You have to create your rules, your culture, your sense of right and wrong. And they were certainly doing that during the time period. Well, I do want to point out that uh, in spite of all those great things that you say they've contributed, and they have, uh, to our culture, it was a theocracy, and I think he uses this as the backdrop of his story for a couple of reasons. First of all, I mean, everybody in the West now kind of see some of the extremism of that, and so it's easy to use them as kind of a foil for what he wants to do. Uh, there, it is true that in the Puritan era, you were sentenced to time on scaffolds. Am I wrong if you did something uh, that was offensive or outwardly wrong? Oh, you are correct. The, cer the Puritans were certainly about uh, social and cultural order, very much so. And I do have a little anecdote that really, it's just ironic. It has nothing to do with the story. But in 1637, there was a man named William Prynne, and has no relation to our heroine Hester Prynne, but he was put in the stocks, and they had him branded with the letters SL uh, on his body, but it did, or really on his cheek, but it didn't mean scarlet letter. It meant seditious libeler. Oh, my. So, you know, that it's kind of, it's hyperbolic, yes, to some degree, and we're going to get into this in the very first sentence, but it's also an easy place to start uh, because he's going to um, pick up on a time 
an American history where there was something in his life even that was embarrassing. Hawthorne himself, as in Nathaniel Hawthorne, was related to John Hawthorne. John Hawthorne presided over the Salem Witch Trials of 1692, where we had those girls uh, killed, uh, and they were accused of being witches when they really weren't. This is a great story that's been memorialized by Arthur Miller in the, in the 1950s in the play The Crucible. But he was super embarrassed about this, and he changed the spelling of his name to kind of trying to shed the shame of what his family had done. In fact, John Hawthorne was the only judge that I know of that never felt bad for what happened. So he sets the story there, and you know on the front end He's not going to hide his biases. Uh, and authors do many things in the very beginning of their books. But one of the things that I was told, I was told this by one of my college professors, and he said, students, every author tells his whole story in the first sentence. I don't know if every author tells his story in the first sentence. I don't see the whole story in the first sentence, but I will say this. He does tell you the whole story in the first chapter, or at least the first few sentences, and not in the sense that he's going to reveal his whole plot. But I want us to go through chapter one, and I want us to look at, he is going to tell us his whole story of what he wants to say through the language, through the symbolism, uh, and through kind of the tone of the first chapter. So you ready to take a look at it? I am, and I had one thing I want to throw in before we jump into this. That is Hawthorne's use of the straw man, how he's going to take these Puritans and he's going to make them What's the a straw foil. man? The straw man is you, you have a group of enemies, you take the worst characteristic from all the enemies, and you combine all those worst characteristics into one person. And then you're able to argue against it and rail against it. So he's taken the worst characteristics of the Puritans, wrapped them up in the characters in this book, and laid blame on them. Now, I'm going to stand up for the Puritans a little bit. They have been hammered a lot in U.S. history. They get hammered by Hawthorne in the 1850s with the Scarlet Letters. They get hammered by Arthur Miller in the Crucible in the 1950s. In the 1920s, H.L. Mencken, the social critic, said Puritanism the haunting fear that someone, somewhere, may be happy. Oh, that's awful. <laughs> well, okay. Let's just say that they're not as bad as he's going to make them. And knowing that, let's go see how bad he does make them. Okay. All right. Chapter one, sentence one. We start off with him saying this. A throng of bearded men in sad colored garments and gray steeple crowned hats intermixed with women, some wearing hoods and others bareheaded, was assembled in front of a wooden edifice, the door of which was heavily timbered with oak and studded with iron spikes. All right, a throng. Word two. <laughs> that is not a nice group of people. If you see a throng, you should run the other direction. It always means bad stuff. It always means bad stuff. And these are bearded men. They're covered, their faces, they're concealed, they're hiding, and they're in sad colored garments. Now that's not a color. Sad is not a color. So you can imagine, of course it says gray, but you can think of brown or black or white or colorless of some kind. But he's suggesting immediately that these are depressing, angry people. But they're not just depressing and gray and sad and bearded. They're steeple crowned. And steepled is a church word. So he's introducing the idea that they're also religious. Then he goes on to say they have women wearing hoods and others bareheaded. Wearing hoods is, again, the idea of they're hiding something. Bareheaded means just flat ugly. Of course, it doesn't mean it, but it sounds bad. And he wants it to sound bad. And, of course... They are assembled, this is formal, this is official, in front of nothing else but a horribly dark door studded with iron spikes. So we have a mean door. We have a mean situation. And we don't even know what it is. These are awful people doing mean things in sentence one. And then sentence two, we're going to change our tone a little bit because we're going to be sarcastic. 
the founders of a new colony. Whatever utopia of human virtue and happiness they might originally project have invariably recognized it among their earliest practical necessities to a lot of portion of the virgin soil as a cemetery and another portion as the site of a prison. There's a lot going on here. So what is he saying? They're founding a new colony because, of course, if you found a new colony, you have some sort of insight on life. You're going to make it better than the other people. And, of course, it's going to be a utopia. You're going to have human virtue and happiness. But he suggests that the, although they say that, they're, that they have human virtue and happiness, they don't. And you can tell this from their behaviors. They're saying it's virtuous and happy, but what are they doing? First thing they're doing is building a prison. So the behavior in no way reflects what they say that they live by. So what do we have? We have people that are hypocritical, people that are living one thing and saying another. Not to mention the fact that he throws in the concept of virgin soil. Now, he could have used a lot of words. There were choices interesting. We use the words because they serve us. So he's throwing the idea of sexuality right here. Now, it is a little bit sexual, but, you know, it ain't that kind of podcast. Uh, and, and it is a book about Puritanism, so, you know, calm down. But he's introducing, telling us, really, that that's going to be an element of our story. He goes on to talk about um, where they built the prison house. And they built it in the middle of town, and he uses the word nucleus. That's a science word. It's the heart of life. It's the heart of things that are growing and things that are developing. Of course, I'm no science person, but and neither is Hawthorne. So what is he saying? The prison is at the heart of their culture. Uh, then he goes on to say not only that, but it's been used a lot. Uh, 15, 20 years after the settlement of the town, the wooden jail was already marked with weather stains and other indications of age, which give a yet darker aspect to its beetled brow and gloomy front. So it's ugly, and it's at the heart of their world. Uh, there's rust on the door. Uh, it looks old. It looks dark. And then it says this, like all that pertains to crime, it seemed never to have known a youthful era. And the idea behind youth here is a happy era, an idea where we never had the life. We just went straight to the darkness and death. So was the reader supposed to catch the sarcasm here? He, he, in the very second sentence, he uses the word utopia and then goes on to describe a miserable existence. And what I find interesting about that is that Hawthorne, in the, in the midst of his adult world, is very aware of all the utopian movements going on in the United States at the current time. So he's connecting that uh, to the story. I find that very interesting that that idea is even coming to play in a book about Puritans. So what would be some of those utopian things that you're talking about? Oh, we had all kind of religious movements. We, uh, we had free love colonies, which were pretty scandalous during that time period. Uh, communal marriage colonies. So Every everybody was just kind of showing up with their own perfect world. Well, there's an area called the Burned Over District in western New York State, and it just seemed to be a hotbed of every different kind of uh, utopian group. But interestingly enough, there are some other long-lasting elements that come out of that, like the abolitionist movement and the women's suffrage movement. Well, in his case, he throws it. Yeah, there's, there's no doubt, to answer your question, you're supposed to see the... the the irony you're supposed to see this feel the sarcasm even if you don't really understand what he means you can feel the change in the tone and he comes down to the end and the last thing i want to point out here well not really the last thing but the next thing that i want to point out is the idea that before the ugly edifice and between it and the wheel track of the street was a grass plot much overgrown with burdock pigweed apple peru and such unsightly vegetation which evidently found something congenial in the soil so what we're going to see hawthorne do throughout the entire book and it starts right here is nature plays a role now in all romantic literature and this is even in the british stuff nature is pure and nature is beautiful 
and industry isn't. Or man, you know, is corrupt in the sense that and nature is pure. But he's going to take it a step farther. Nature is very, um, it's God. It's God. Now, he doesn't embrace God in the way that Christians embrace God. To a Christian, God is a person. God is an entity. And he doesn't look at God in that way. He's going to create this concept of, a, of God that's more like what the transcendentals think, although he's not a transcendentalist, or even more like what the Hindus believe, that God is out there, and God is speaking through the environment of nature. And so God is going to speak, uh, he's going to talk to the reader about what he thinks about what's going on in this story. And right here we see this. God is expressing himself. Nature is expressing itself. So around this edifice, what do we see? We have all this ugly vegetation, burdock and pigweed and apple peru. And so God is saying, this is ugly. This is wrong. I do not approve of this message, so to speak. And so evidently, uh, because those weeds are finding something congenial in the prison soil. And then if you didn't pick up the symbolism at that point, he's going to make it extremely obvious that had so borne that black flower of civilized society. And what is the black flower? He tells you right after the comma, it's a prison. And so there's the darkness, and then he's going to juxtapose it on the other side. He's going to say this. But on one side of the portal, and rooted almost at the threshold, was a wild rose bush covered in this month of June with its delicate gems, which might be imagined to offer their fragrance and fragile beauty to the prisoner as he walked in. So we see a, a tone shift, a shift in the language, where we had all these ugly words like throng and sad and dark and rust and beetle brow and unsightly vegetation. Now we're going to have a wild, woo rose bush and a rose bush is pretty and it's delicate gems and it has a nice and fragrant and it's what well, it has a nice fragrance and it's fragile beauty so the idea is even in all the ugliness there is still something beautiful that's surviving and it's right there for the prisoner to appreciate as he walks in and the condemned criminal as he goes out and then you notice here in token that the deep heart of nature, which is capitalized, could pity and be kind to him. In other words, man is being cruel to man, and nature honors that to some degree with this little expression of beauty. What I find interesting about all that is that the Puritans in the society they've created are described as being elements of the pigweed which I have no idea what pigweed looks like, but that can't be good. Mm -mm. And uh, pigweed, apple peru, uh, black flowers. And then we have this beautiful rose bush in the middle of all that, that uh, horrible vegetation. So the Puritans are being symbolized by the negative weeds. And then there's this beautiful rose bush. And he goes on to say that the rose bush, by a strange chance, has been kept alive in history. But whether it had merely survived out of the stern old wilderness so long after the fall of the gigantic pines and oaks that originally overshadowed it, or whether, as there is fair authority for believing, it had sprung up under the footsteps of the sainted Anne Hutchison. Who's that? Well, this is a very historically important point. As I'm reading the book... Before I even know where the book's going, I'm going, Anne Hutchison, she's important. Anne Hutchison was uh, a religious, considered a religious heretic at the time period. She'd gotten into uh, horrible public arguments with the church leadership, the Congregationalist Church leadership of Massachusetts in the colony. They had a huge doctrinal theological disagreement. And here was a woman in the 17th century who is uh, going toe-to-toe -to -toe arguing with the male leadership over issues of theology, and her teachings were eventually judged as heretical, and she was thrown out of the colony and sent to Rhode Island, where eventually her and some of her remaining family are going to meet a pretty gruesome end. So he's yeah. re referring to Anne Hutchison as the saintly rosebush. That's a direct slap in the face to the puritanical, uh, or to the idea of puritanism. 
So for the unhistorically minded, let me translate what you just said. <laughs> Anne Hutchinson is a woman who stood up to the man. Well, let me talk about our isms. <laughs> you can read literature and history and put any ism you want on top of it as you explain it. And many people do want to make this a feminist novel, and they can. I'm just but, saying that's what you said. Okay. <laughs> At the root of it, it was a huge religious disagreement, and it's hard to know which was the bigger the bigger issue: the uh, the the wars uh, between the genders or the religious element. But either way, it ended up being very very costly to Anne Hutchison. Well, his point is, and I I am belaboring that a little bit, but let me just say this: his point is that uh, right there where she walks there's beautiful things that are springing up. So nature likes her. Nature is reacting positively as she enters the door. And he ends chapter one saying, finding it so directly on the threshold of our narrative, which is now about to issue from the inauspicious portal. So he's going to make a connection between Anne Hutchinson and our uh, heroine who's getting ready to come out of that door and he said, we can hardly do otherwise than pluck one of its flowers, like from the wild rose bush, and present it to the reader. Then he says this, it may serve, let us hope, to symbolize some sweet moral blossom. And I want to point out that he's not running away from the fact that this is a book about morality. Not every book is. Not every theme is about morality, but he wants this one to be. I'm not saying this is a morality tale. It's not a parable because it's not, but it's about human morality. And he says it's going to symbolize some sweet moral blossom that may be found along the track and relive the darkening close of a tale. And then he says, because this is what the book is about. It's about human frailty. And to be human, whether you want to accept it or not, is to be frail. And with that will always come sorrow. Well, I guess that wraps up episode one. Um, next week, we will look at chapters two through eight. We'll meet all of our characters on the scaffold scene in chapter two. This book does have three scaffold scenes. The first one's going to be in chapter two. Then we'll delve into the character of Hester and how the Scarlet Letter changes her, as well as that of Little Pearl. And then we'll end with the showdown between Hester and the men in the world, and we're going to watch her stare them down. We hope you pick up the book this week and join the journey and read it with us. But even if you don't, come back next time and learn what's great about the Scarlet Letter. Remember to hit subscribe and join us for more adventures with Hester and the rest of the crew of the Scarlet Letter.